All right, well, this session is called One Flesh, and it is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, uh, through the first part of chapter 7, down to about verse 5, and we're going to speak of uh, one flesh. And so I'll read the text, and then we'll get into uh, discussing that together. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, here the Bible says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. The husband, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you again for your word. Uh, we acknowledge that we are under the authority of your word, and God, we rejoice to submit to it. And thank you for the, the power of the Spirit within us, God, to enable us, empower us to submit to it and to obey it. And here again, Lord, we come upon a subject uh, in marriage, extremely important. And Lord, we want to obey you in this because you mean all things together for our good. And we acknowledge that and thank you for it. So help us as we listen. I pray, Lord, that we would uh, be convicted of sin, that we would be conformed into the image of Christ, that you would equip us and inform us, God, enable us by your spirit to live a godly Christian marriage uh, to your glory, God, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, one flesh here, one flesh. Uh, one flesh involves the guarding of your marriage, the guarding of your marriage from sexual immorality. Uh, sexual immorality ravages marriages. It ravages an individual's life. Uh, if you're not married, you're single. Uh, sexual immorality is particularly enslaving and particularly destructive. It is extremely harmful. Uh, it'll kill, your, kill you. <laughs> it seeks to devour you. it also kill your marriage. And there are many ways in marriage that you can be sexually immoral. We'll see several from this passage. But you entail, when you get married... You uh, look at your spouse and you want to build, if you're a genuine Christian, you want to build a God-glorifying marriage, marriage that honors Christ, right? And so you're, you're out to build this beautiful marriage, but you have wonderful and biblical ideals for all that that entails, what it looks like to have a godly marriage. You love one another, you sacrifice for one another, you're going to study together and you're going to pray together and never again be hijacked by sexual immorality uh, because you're married. Is that the way it works? No, no. You think I'm going to be married and so I'll never have a problem with sexual immorality ever again. It's not the way it works. Uh, even in your marriage, there is a black fungus that sits in the corner, in a dark corner of your marriage, dark corner of your world. And pretty soon that black fungus begins growing, begins spreading, begins taking over every aspect of your little corner of the world, your little marriage, your little room that you're in. And you begin to, begin to fight, but it takes over 
the closet space and you fight and it begins to take over the, the left side of the room and you fight and it takes over the lampstand and you fight and it takes over the bed and you fight and it spreads itself down the hallway. Pretty soon you have black fungus all over your house, all over your marriage, all over you. And you fight and fight, but it's taking over everything. You begin to battle it but you feel like you're fighting with cotton balls and toothpicks. You just can't get anywhere in the battle against it. And pretty soon you are completely preoccupied in your marriage, preoccupied in your life, preoccupied in your spiritual life by this looming black fungus. It is disgusting. It plagues your thoughts. Uh, it loads you down with guilt. You want to get rid of it altogether, but you feel almost powerless to do anything about it. The difficulty is only intensified considering the fact that black fungus fertilizer is everywhere. <laughs> it's like people actually want to grow this stuff. Black fungus fertilizer is being sold everywhere you look. It's on billboards. It's on TV shows. It's in the movies. It's all over the magazines in the grocery store checkout line. Uh, it's being sold with everything. The black fungus is everywhere you look, from soft drinks to refrigerators uh, to cars to motor oil to drain cleaner. <laughs> Pretty much no matter what is being sold, what is being advertised, there's the black fungus fertilizer right there with it. You'd think we were starved for black fungus when we're actually completely saturated with it. It influences how people dress. The back fungus influences how people act, how they think, how they work, how they live, how they raise their children, how they spend their money, and yes, how they treat their spouse. Looking at this circumstance from, a, from an outsider's perspective, you might imagine that in our world, there is nothing more important to anyone anywhere than the black fungus. People will fight for the black fungus. They'll change laws for it. They'll sneak around to get it. They'll steal, cheat, and lie for it. They go against nature for it. They risk their marriages for it. They kill their babies for it. This sexual bombardment has taken its toll. And sexual immorality is a serious, serious problem. And it is a serious problem among professing Christians and a serious problem in professing Christian marriages. The city of Corinth was a society very much like ours. They had a problem with the black fungus too. Uh, Corinth was situated between two seas, the Adriatic and the Aegean Sea, and it was a port city, and much of the trade that went through that part of the world went through Corinth. It was the sin city of its day. A prostitution, riotous living, debauched lifestyles were overly common, so much so that a Greek word at the time, Corinthianazomai, meant to commit fornication. You actually use the word for the city of Corinth in a word that meant to commit fornication. A Corinthian feast was the term coined for a debauched orgy. A Corinthian drinker was a chronic alcoholic. The adjective Corinthian was used for debauched behavior. That was a society that they lived in. It was everywhere. And Corinth had a serious problem with it, just like we do today. And at Paul, in that environment, just like he does today, commands in that environment for men and women to flee sexual immorality, gives the command. So he calls Christians to sexual purity even while living in such a wicked environment. So in other words, there is no excuse. Our world is over-consumed with the black fungus, and that gives you no excuse for sexual sin. Uh, the pledge today to maintain sexual purity in your marriage is to fight the black fungus. You must be, in order to fight the black fungus in your marriage, you must be one flesh. If you're single, that gives you no excuse. There is no excuse, I'm not married, it's more difficult for me. There's no excuse for sin. The Lord is sovereign over that. The Lord empowers you. The Lord gives you commands in scriptures that you in the Lord, under the power of the Holy Spirit, can fight. And in marriage, those tools are a little different. But you are to fight whether you're single or you're to fight whether you're married, you're to be sexually pure. Now there were professing believers in Corinth, professing believers who were attempting to deal with this problem of sexual immorality. And they dealt with it in one of two ways, all right? There were those believers or professed believers who were trying to justify their sexual morality with licentiousness. They argued that everything was permissible for the Christian. 
And they considered bodily appetites like eating and sex to be nothing more than biology. And they fulfilled those appetites like eating food. It was just a matter of indifference to them, right? Food is for the body, sex is for the body. It was just a matter of biology to them and they were licentious. Others in Corinth at the time were legalistic or they were ascetic. Um, they had what they thought based on scripture was an extreme commitment to abstinence or to celibacy. So much so that they would argue that sex wasn't permissible under any circumstances, whether you were married or not married. You just weren't to do that. It was uh, anything dealing with the body was bad or was sinful. And so here in our text today, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul deals with the licentiousness in chapter 6, and then he gets into the legalistic or the ascetic in chapter 7. And in discussing this, it all hinges or pivots on verse 18 in chapter 6, where Paul commands, flee sexual immorality. We're going to look at ways to do that today. In doing so, he offers much help for us today. In your Christian life, you're going to battle constantly between two ditches, either a mindset or an understanding of scripture that leads you to licentiousness or a mindset or an understanding of scripture that leads you to legalism. You've got to battle between those two ditches and flee sexual uh, immorality. So now let's look at four points from our text, four points. We're looking at chapter six, beginning in verse 12, and we're gonna get right thinking, right thinking on this issue. You must know what you're fighting and why. This is not mere biology. Sexual purity in your marriage, there's something spiritual going on there. Far more than just physical, far more than just biology, there is a spiritual aspect to this. Secondly, from verses 15 to 17, we're going to get right theology. He's going to introduce the thinking, and then he's going to talk about the theology that leads to that thinking. This battle is not about you. It's not about you. Paul says it's a great mystery, but he speaks concerning Christ and the church. There's rich theology that can help us in the battle. Point three, we're going to see part one of a right response. Part one of a right response. You're to flee. If you're married, you're to flee together. If you're married, you are one flesh, and you're to fight this war together as a married couple. And then point four, we're going to see part two of a right response. You're to fight together. One right response is to flee together. The second correct response in a marriage is to fight together. Remember this, if you're married, you are in this together. The two have become one flesh, all right? Isolation. Isolation in your marriage is a relationship killer. You cannot be isolated from one another in the battle, in the fight. You have to do this together. Nothing drives two people apart by sinning, but sinning together, <laughs> like sinning together. Nothing drives two people apart like sinning together. One thing you don't want to do is sin together by being apart. You're going to fight this together. And you must leave and cleave and become one uh, in this, era, in this uh, effort. All right, let's look at, take a look at right thinking. Right thinking is going to come to us from uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Paul says here, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. And now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So let's take that first phrase in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. The first part of this was thought to be a slogan in Corinth. They began to believe that because I'm a Christian, well, the law doesn't apply to me. I'm no longer under the law. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound like today? We find the same stuff today, right? I'm no longer under the law. I'm under grace. And so all things are lawful for me. Um, the, the Bible speaks of freedom that we have in Christ. Galatians 5 talks about that. We have liberty in Christ. And so this group of licentious libertines in Corinth were taking that to mean they could do anything they wanted to. If they wanted to run off up the hill to the uh, pagan temple and sleep with pagan prostitute you know, temple worshipers, they could. Uh, if they wanted to engage in sexual immorality, they could. Of course, it's just biology. It's just the body. And they had it wrong. Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. People then, just like people today, twist passages like this to give them an excuse for sin. Uh, but in the very same chapter, Paul says in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16, 
Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. There are gonna be things that you want to do, but if you have the spirit of God in you, the spirit of God wrestles, fights against the as Paul says in Romans 7, the law that is in your members because the two are contrary to one another and you're not gonna be able to do the things that you want to do. He says in verse 18, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, all four of those words dealing with sexual immorality. Idolatry, sexual immorality is idolatry. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. When the Bible speaks of the freedom that we have in Christ, it's always the freedom from trying to earn salvation by works of the law. And it's freedom from the enslavement of sin to live for Christ and not sin. Uh, so freedom is not a freedom to do anything you want because you're not under law but under grace. It's a freedom to not sin. It's a freedom that we are under grace. We don't have to work our way to heaven. And in, in essence, Galatians 5, when it's talking about how if you are led by the Spirit, you're not going to be constrained or pulled or enslaved by the flesh. It's basically saying, welcome to the war. <laughs> the Christian life, the Christian marriage is a battle. It is a battle. When Christ, or when Paul says that when you come to Christ, the Spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you, what? Want or wish, it's a battle. You're not going to be able to do the things that you want to do. Paul qualifies the statement in verse 12 when he says, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. And there is a principle in our members that wars against the principle in our mind. And that law, that principle in our members, that fleshly tug, pull towards sexual immorality wants to enslave you. It wants to enslave you, bring you into captivity. Sin is never helpful. It is always destructive, whether it's public sin or your own pet private sin. You believe it to be private, it is devastating. It is destructive. It is particularly destructive when it's sexual sin. God's grace is free, but the cost of sin is impossibly high. It is destructive. Think about David and his lust. If you read your Bible and you know that story, you see sin upon sin, consequence upon consequence upon consequence upon consequence, sin breeding sin, breeding sin, breeding sin, right? Think about the, the lust of Israel in committing sexual immorality. And I think it's 1 Corinthians 10 that talks about how there were 23,000 that were killed in one day because of Israel's lust, Israel's sexual immorality. Think about the marriages, the families, the churches, that have all been destroyed by sexual sin. And sexual sin will destroy your marriage uh, as well. If you have that attitude like we had before, that divorce is not an option, then it's gonna destroy the joy and marital bliss that is possible in your marriage. And you'll be miserable. Um, it'll destroy your marriage. Now Paul completes verse 12 by stating that all things are lawful for me, but he makes this statement. He says, I'll not be brought under the power of any. Sexual sin, again, is particularly enslaving, bringing you under its power. The more that you have your fo foot on that slippery slope and the more that you slide down the slope, the more enslaved to it you become. The more you indulge your flesh with it, the more it controls you. Sexual sin sits at the door and its desire is to have you. And you'll feel this pull towards sexual temptation throughout your marriage. And some of you here this morning now are enslaved. You've been controlled by it. Uh, you are under the power of enslaving impulses. You're not a master of your own desires. You're enslaved to them. And today needs to be your independence day. Uh, today needs to be your independence day. You need to free by the power of the spirit 
Free yourself from these enslaving temptations. Free your marriage from your own fleshly impulses. This needs to be your Independence Day. Uh, Paul wraps up this thought process here in verses 13 and 14. Um, this is not simply biology that we're dealing with here. It's, like, it's not like our appetite for food. Food was made for the stomach and God is going to do away with both of them. That whole process is going away. But there were those that were using this physical temporary process to justify their sexual sin. Uh, this is not the case with the body. The body is to be a vessel for God's use, verse 12, 13, and 14. And the body is to be a vessel for God's glory. And the body is designed not only to be used in this life, but in the next. Uh, your body will be used in the life to come. Now let's support these points. Now these are the main points that he's making for right thinking in verses 12 through 14. Let's support these now with right theology from verses 15 to 17. In verse 15, the Bible says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Again, something more than just biology is going on. This is a spiritual union. You're fighting a spiritual war when you're fighting against sexual immorality. And you're fighting more than biology, more than just impulses. You need to understand then that up front, this is not, a just, not just about self-control. It's not just about self-discipline. Gritting it out in your own power, in your own energy. This is a spiritual war that you're fighting. And there are, there are two unions mentioned here. There's a union between the Christian and Christ. And then there's a union alluded to, to here between a man and a woman in a sexual relationship in their marriage. The two shall become one flesh. Now the first union follows logically from verse 13 that the body belongs to the Lord. You're, when you become a Christian, you are entered into union with Christ. You're baptized into Christ. You become one with Christ and one with Christ's body. And here, we're all members of Christ if you're in Christ. We know this from Romans 12, right? When we are, though many, we are one body. We know that from Romans 12, from 1 Corinthians 12. And he follows in verse 17 with a, this glorious truth that we are one spirit with him. So again, something more than just physical here. This is a spiritual battle you're facing. Um, so then, to take a member of Christ's body and to make them members of a harlot is especially grievous to God. This is not just physical. There's something spiritual going on here. This is extremely grievous to God. For a Christian to engage in sexual immorality engages the Lord it profanes the name of the Lord. Again, not in a way that personally corrupts Christ with your sin. Again, back to that, old, that analogy that um, no more than a sunbeam that shines on a garbage dump is corrupted by it. But his name is profane. He's blasphemed because of the association. In that sense, it is a, a horrifying notion to Paul that you would take your members, connect them to a harlot, and he responds, never, may it never be. Right, the second union here, beginning in verse 15, involves the union between a man and a woman in marriage. The most obvious understanding of this union is physical. The Bible says in Genesis 2.24, it describes that they will become one flesh. However, there's more than just the physical in mind here. Again, more than just biology. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, that Christ nourishes and cherishes his body, the church, because we are of his flesh and of his bones. You're not only to leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife and become one flesh with her, but when you leave this wicked world, leave your own sin behind to follow Christ by faith, you become of his flesh and of his bones. You become one with Christ. And this mystery, when Christ says that this mystery has everything to do with Christ and his bride, the church, a mystery usually refers to something that was hidden in the Old Testament now revealed, not mysterious any longer, in the New Testament. And here it is, that marriage is God-designed and is God-designed as a reflection of the glorious union between Christ and his church. 
So this one fleshness, you've got to see, goes more beyond just the physical. This is referring to the connection between husband and wife. This is the flesh and bones cementing of husband and wife. This is the God-authored love and commitment to one another as husband and wife. This is the cherishing and nourishing attachment of husband and wife together. There is a permanence here to their unity. Uh, this is referring to the peace, the comfort, the security of our union with our husband or wife. And this is the purifying and sanctifying love that we're to show each other in our union together. And this is the, in the carrying out of God-ordained roles. Marriage is to be a sacred and beautiful picture of the union that Christ has with his body, the church. It's to be a visual expression of that, a visual demonstration of the love that Christ has for his church. You are not your own, so you're to glorify God in your body. Now think about that. We mentioned this already in the, in the first session. You think about it then, marriage, again, is not about you. It's about the glory of God. It has aspects of help for you, but ultimately it's about the glory of God. It is a living, breathing, organic display of the gospel, of the relationship between Christ and the church. Uh, it's to be a glorious monument, a testimony, uh, a sacred tribute, if you will. The Bible begins with a marriage and ends with a marriage. Marriage is transcendent, all right? For that reason, we need to understand our marriages that this is something that Satan particularly hates particularly hates because they hate the gospel. They hate everything that the gospel represents. And so they're going to hate your marriage and they're going to hate the union that you have with your husband or wife in marriage. So behind all of this, you've got Satan and his minions attacking. They watch, they see what turns your head. They see what interests you and what you look at. They sit behind the scenes seeking to make you fall, waiting for opportunity. They're in control of the world system. And so they very intentionally and very practically put things in place to make you trip, to make you stumble. They sit behind the scenes and they want to have that happen. They want to destroy your marriage because your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Uh, and they hate that. So to fight our corrupt understanding of all this, the struggle, this is exactly what the serpent offered Adam and Eve in the garden. He offered them in knowledge of good and evil, offered them this struggle. It's not just about you. It's not just about biology. And it's not just about physical impulses. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says this, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you ever wonder where the battle for marriage in our country fits into the spiritual picture, into the spiritual perspective? Tie Christ to a harlot. Tie him to everything which is unnatural. Uh, that's why sodomy is not just like every other sin. It's unnatural. And it ties, supposedly, Christ to something that is unnatural. Remember our black fungus. Satan has invested a tremendous amount of energy into spreading the killer and spreading the fertilizer. Uh, and it's really that difficult. In our society, is it really that difficult to identify a main front in that battle? Main front really is sexual immorality. Often in our society, it is everywhere and it's constant. Uh, they infiltrate your environment more and more invasive ways. They infiltrate your marriage more and more invasive ways. God creates something good like technology and then Satan twists it and corrupts it to invade your Christian life, to invade your marriage with temptation. They use every means that is available to them. That's why right now, as you sit together and think about this issue of sexual immorality, that you have to learn to fight together. That you have to fight, you have to flee, you have to fight, and you have to fight and flee together. Russell Moore said this. He said that um, you must understand that marriage takes place on a spiritual battlefield far more than it does on a romantic balcony. <laughs> it's not a romantic balcony. This is a spiritual battlefield. This is not a sappy, sentimentalized love story. This is not the sentimentalized TV or movie love affair. It makes everything look good. 
right? Makes everything look promising. Gives you promise of everything you think you don't have in your marriage and entices you to gulp down the hook. It's not the high school butterflies with no responsibility, no accountability. It's not even about how good looking you are, how fat or skinny, tall or short. You think to yourself, I look at myself in the mirror every day, nobody is interested. <laughs> and then Satan comes along with a deception invading your marriage. The battlefield that you're fighting on is littered with casualties, littered with casualties. Think about all of those, the carnage of all those that have fallen. And Satan seeks to tear to shreds everything that you stand for in Christ. Tear it to shreds. A faithful husband, a faithful wife are people who are fighting together to put to death the deeds of the body. Not only as individuals, but as a couple. You men are a warrior prince. Your wife is a warrior princess, both fighting for Christ in your marriage. So how do you fight? Point three, verses 18 to 20. Paul says in verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he commit, who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Filled with exhortation. And then here too, theological explanation. First thing you have to do is you have to know how to fight. You have to know how to fight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says this, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. You should know how to possess your own vessel. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 that he buffets his body. He disciplines his body and brings it into subjection. So the first battle st strategy we see in verse 18 is to flee, is to flee. The word there for flee, the verb, is a continuous way of life a continuous fleeing, a constant fleeing. You keep fleeing until the danger is past. And when is the danger past? Never, never. You just keep fleeing. You keep fleeing. You never, as soon as, soon as you think there's, the moment of temptation is gone, there's another deadly trap laid, right? You keep fleeing. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, committing sexual immorality is like doing the act in church. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God once dwelt in the garden. Then he dwelt in the tabernacle. Then he dwelt in the temple. Now he dwells in you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians, think about this for a moment. The Corinthians had been running off to the, to the pagan temple after temple prostitutes. And here, much worse, the professing Christian performs the act in the temple of the Holy Spirit, his own body which is worse, the, the Corinthian running off to the pagan temple. We no longer as Christians belong to ourselves. First Peter chapter one says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Therefore, again, glorify, your, glorify God in your body and in your spirit and flee sexual immorality. One, you've got to flee every single instance of it. Swim upstream. Know yourself. Know yourself. Sit down and understand how to possess your own vessel, where your weaknesses are, where your vulnerabilities are. Go all the way upstream and find out where all of that begins. Get to the source and that's where you need to start fleeing. If it is a simple glance at the magazine, then start the battle there. You don't give in to that temptation. If it's the billboard that you pass every day going to work, take another direction to work. Uh, if it's the computer, do what you have to do to fight the digital harlot at every single point along the way. Find out where that begins and start fleeing there. You've got to swim all the way upstream and know yourself and your vulnerabilities. This is not a, a sappy love story. I love this. Uh, not original. 
and where I heard this, but this is not a sappy love movie. This is not a chick flick. This is a werewolf movie. A werewolf movie. What do they do with werewolves? Listen, I know the full moon is coming. And before this happens to me, as soon as there's any indication whatsoever that there is a full moon rising, we know it's coming. And so chain me in the basement and don't let me out until the full moon has passed. Right? This is a werewolf movie, not a sappy love story. Find out where your vulnerabilities are. You fight and flee together with your spouse. Listen, you need to tell your wife where your vulnerabilities are. Men don't get threatened by this. You need to understand your wife also struggles. Wives, you need to tell your husbands where your vulnerabilities are. And fight and flee together. Chain yourself in the basement if necessary until you can turn back into a reasonably thinking Christian man or woman instead of the werewolf that you become. This is exactly what it means to deny yourself, right? Take up your cross, you deny yourself. Uh, once you compromise even a little, once you compromise even a little, then the world, the flesh, and the devil will make sure you get exactly what you want. They will set out for you to have exactly what you want. And down you go. Devastating your conscience all the way down, making wreckage of your life, wreckage of your marriage. Flee every single instance, every little detail. Know yourself. Possess your own vessel. Two, flee with your wife or with your husband. Flee together. Wives, wage war as a warrior princess. Wage war with demons here and fight with your husband for Christ and for your marriage. You being the warrior princess need to understand and not be offended not be threatened by the fact that your husband struggles in this area. You're fighting a war. And you either, husbands, don't be threatened that your wife has these difficulties. Your husband, women, your husband will have attractions toward other women. If he says anything different, he is a liar. <laughs> and go back to Mark's uh, sermon on communication and don't lie to one another in this. Wives, don't be threatened. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that you are inferior. Pour contempt on your ego and help him fight. When he comes and he says to you that he is weak or he feels vulnerable in this area, feels vulnerable to sexual temptation, what he is saying is that he loves you. He wants you and he wants his marriage to be great. Please help me fight in this area. That's what he's communicating to you. Sin and temptation here in the marriage cannot remain hidden. That's one of Satan's devices, is to keep it secret. That you don't communicate with your spouse. And so Satan wants you to keep it secret because in keeping it secret, keeping your sin hidden, you're more and more vulnerable to that sin. More and more vulnerable temptation to temptation. You've got to fight together. Secrecy keeps you enslaved. Proverbs says that it is the bread that is eaten in secret that is sweet. It is particularly enslaving. So get it out in the open. It's the forbidden love thing, right? Get it out in the open. You and your wife, you and your husband need to leave here at some point today uh, and go home and talk openly about this subject. Get it on the table. Confess your sin. Confess where you are vulnerable and weak. Talk openly about temptation. It cannot remain hidden. It's got to come out of the dark. You've got to break the silence and break the secrecy. You need to pray about it together. Talk about it openly together. Help one another openly with it together. And there must be openness about this in order to effectively handle it. The longer that you think you can deceive yourself by keeping it hidden and fight this thing on your own is the longer that you will remain in battle and enslaved over it. You've got to talk openly about it. Isolation is a subtle killer of your marriage. Don't keep trying to do this in isolation from your husband, in isolation from your wife. Flee every instance, flee with your spouse. Next, flee to Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Flee to the promises of God, the strength of God, the enablement of God. Remember, this is not a battle with flesh and blood. If you were battling only with flesh and blood, then it would only entail weapons of flesh and blood, and you could battle with flesh and blood weapons. 
But you need spiritual weapons, mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. There's a really good book I want to recommend to you. It's Finally Free by Heath Lambert. It specifically deals with the sin of pornography, but it gives principles that broadly apply to sexual immorality. And the table of contents in that book reads like this, grace as a foundation in the fight, using sorrow to fight, using accountability to fight, all biblically explained, using confession to fight, uh, using your spouse or your singleness to fight, using humility to fight, using gratitude to fight, all spiritual, biblically grounded weapons of your warfare to fight sexual immorality. You can't fight the black fungus with a spork. <laughs> you need weapons mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You need holiness producing, desire transforming, heart changing, hope cultivating, spirit enabling, God glorifying weapons of sin destruction. Thanks brother. Um, you can't fight the black fungus with a spork. It's even better when you have all of those weapons in both hands, in the hands of your wife and in the hands of the husband, both fighting that way. All right, flee every instance, flee with your spouse, flee to Christ. Next, let's look at right response part two, beginning in chapter seven. Right response part two. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, Paul says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves, excuse me, to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Here in response now, Paul is going to take on the legalists or the ascetics, uh, those that think you should avoid sexual in intimacy altogether. In verse 1 and 2, Paul's saying that celibacy inside of marriage is not good. Celibacy inside of marriage is not good. If you've been abstaining from sexual in intimacy, it's not good. It's not good. If someone has been given the gift of singleness, that's one thing. But that is simply not the case if you are married. If you are married, that's not the case. And celibacy or abstinence in your marriage is not good. Not to be practiced if you are married. In verses two and three here, you are not to deprive your spouse. Intimacy in marriage is obligatory. It's a duty that you are to render. It is a service due, a payment due in all the good ways that Lord intends that. And it's for the purpose in verse five that you do not deprive one another. You may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Come together again for the reason that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So Paul gives a command in verse five, do not deprive one another in your marriage of sexual intimacy. Now, this is God's wisdom, not your wisdom. This is God's wisdom, not your worldly reasoning. And so if you think, I'm fine the way things are, and if we only have int some intimacy once every eight months, that's perfectly okay with me. That is your reasoning, not God's reasoning. God's reasoning says that celibacy is not good in your marriage. You are not to deprive one another. You are to come together because Satan will tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There's all kinds of difficulty, all kinds of temptation that arise in a marriage when husband and wife are celibate with each other. Uh, when you're not regularly rendering to your spouse that which is due her. Um, it's simply not the case if you're, marriage, uh, if you're married. You must view intimacy as something that you're owed, that you owe your spouse. Don't deprive one another. Marriage, in light of that now, marriage cannot be reduced to nothing more than being an escape valve for your sexual impulses. And your wife cannot feel as though that that's all it is to you men. However, it is an outlet and a protection and among the many reasons that God provides for marriage. Don't deprive your, your spouse. All this cannot be an excuse for sexual sin. Men, you can't your wife, use your wife in that way to gratify sinful sexual impulses, acting out pornographic images or acting out scenes from your past or memories. Um, you are for each other in this. And it seems somewhat in uh, verse four, 
In verse 4, chapter 7, verse 4, you have what some have called an elegant paradox. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Uh, the at issue here in this verse is the word power or authority, the authority that's being spoken about. You have in marriage the custom, if you will, of the father giving away the daughter to her new husband and is giving away. She is giving the daughter to her bridegroom to be his. Here in verse four, this giving, this authority, when it comes to sexual intimacy is twofold, is mutual. Everything here is given mutually. Each one has authority. Wife has authority over the husband's body. Husband has authority over the wife's body. And in the context of this letter, it would mean this. Men, as the Corinthians, you don't have the right to traipse off to the idol temple and sleep with temple prostitutes. Whether that's a digital prostitute, a mental prostitute, or merely a physical self, selfish indulgence. You have an obligation to your wife. None of that is allowable because you don't have authority over your own body to do with your own body as you wish. Your wife does. So you can't use your body in that way. Your wife is too. It belongs to the Lord, verse 13 in chapter six, and to your wife. Specifically again in chapter seven, ladies, you don't have the right to be celibate in marriage or ascetics. Anger is not an excuse. Selfishness is not an excuse. You're not to use sex as a bargaining chip or withhold it as a weapon. You have an obligation to your husband. Your body is not your own to do with as you please. It belongs to the Lord and belongs to your husband. Husbands, you don't have the right to abuse your wives or to force her anything in any relate, relationship to that, to make her do things she doesn't want to because your body is not your own and you cannot use it as you will without her consent. You begin to see the paradox here. Many times I've heard this taught as, man, you can do whatever you want to because that's your, her body. Uh, see that chair there? You have the right to sit in it and it's explained that way. That's not what this text is saying. Man, you don't have a right to your own sexual immorality because your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord and to your wife. Women, you don't have a right to sexual immorality because your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to you, the Lord and to your husband. Man, the paradox here, you can't do whatever you want to do with your wife because without her consent because your body doesn't belong to you in that sense. You don't have authority to use your body as you want to because your wife does. Likewise with women. Uh, there is such here a mutual authority. There's a mutual love, a mutual respect in line with what we know the scripture teaches. The scripture clearly teaches, look out for each other and esteem her, esteem him more than yourself. Esteem others more highly than yourself. And one way it's been suggested is that the wife does not have exclusive rights over her body. The husband does not have exclusive rights over his body. Either way that you look at it, follow this guideline. Uh, for verse four here. The equality in authority here results from a person limiting their freedom for their partner, not the partner exercising a right over the spouse. Does that make sense? You're limiting their, your freedom on behalf of your partner. It's not the partner exercising a right over the spouse. The notion of rights really in scripture is sort of foreign to all that we see in scripture. You are undeserving of any grace. You are undeserving of anything that you have. And so it's always rights or freedoms or liberties that are limited for the benefit of another rather than enforced for the benefit of yourself. For that reason, wife, limit your rights, limit your so-called liberties and render to your husband what is due. Husbands, that's, that's given as a responsibility to the wife, not to the husband to enforce that. You understand the difference? Husbands, you limit your right. You limit your right over your own body. You limit the freedoms that you have with your own body. Really don't have any freedoms in Christ to do whatever you want to. Your body is the Lord's and your wife's. You limit your own freedoms for the benefit of esteeming your wife. You are for your wife. You're not there to gratify your own selfish indulgences. You're not there to gratify your own sinful impulses. You're for your wife. In that sense, intimacy 
becomes something that you do for the benefit of your spouse. Women need to take that responsibility and to do that for your husband in helping him fight sexual immorality. Men, you must render that which is due to your wife to help your wife fight the battle against sexual immorality in the marriage. It's for the benefit of your spouse. I've heard it just explained many times, and I want to correct that, that this is uh, uh, something that men force on wives because they struggle. Sexual intimacy is for the other person. Um, you are to give that which is due to your husband. Give that which is due to your wife. You're not to force that on your wife, force that on your husband. Um, it is a, a give. You see the difference between the two? Uh, one is grace and graciousness and love and tender loving care and kindness and the other isn't. Um, and this helps us to battle. And it's in accord with chapter seven where you're to render to one another the affection due one another. It's a God glorifying rendering, right? All of that to say, you have to fight with your spouse in doing that. Say what you wanna say and think what you wanna think. Again, it's worldly reasoning and your own imagination, your own thought process that you succumb to that fools you into thinking that you can have a sexually pure marriage and be celibate or be separate from one another. You have to fight with one another. You have to flee with one another. One of the weapons that is strong and mighty in God for pulling down strongholds is to render to one another what is due. Uh, these are things that God commands in a marriage to, to help you. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, you, you counsel couples or talk to people and uh, um, much of it to Mark's point comes to communication. There's a big, tremendous part of counseling in a marriage that is about this. Um, there's just no affection there. There's just no tender love, physical affection, physical love. And so you can almost ask the question, well, then how long have you been involved in pornography? Because the two things almost always go together. Uh, if you're having intimacy issues or you're having temptation issues in a marriage, well then how long has it been since you and your wife were faithfully involved in intimacy together in the marriage? And you, you can find out in a matter of seconds exactly where the problem is. And it's often you know, frustrating because you, you've got these weapons, these tools at your disposal that are graces from God and we don't avail ourselves of them because we're too prideful. We don't talk about it with one another. Um, you don't work together to make sure that these things happen. And so right now in your, in your homepage, you need to write those things down. If that's the case with you and your spouse, then you've got to fix that because listen, you cannot presume to believe that everything is okay. If you're not following God's program here, God's design, then there is a problem. And that problem will cause difficulty, cause sin in your marriage. And it'll cause sexually immoral sin, uh, cause sin with sexual immorality. So to wrap this up, it requires each spouse to understand the other's needs, the other's needs, and to humble themselves to help. Each spouse has got to do that. This is not an individual sin issue, married or not. It doesn't involve only you. This is not just a relationship issue. This is a spiritual warfare issue. There are many here today that need to begin this warfare in earnest. And the way to begin that in earnest is to bring it out of the dark, uh, to come out of hiding. Satan in this world would love for you to continue hiding your sin. And they know that if you keep it hidden, they can win confess between one another the challenges that you have uh, and your sin. Talk to your spouse today about these things and resolve to wage war together today. Uh, often, we have the misconception that because a sin is past, that it's over. And it's not the case. Many people carry this sin in their marriage for a very long, sustained amount of time. And you wonder why your marriage feels dead. Why there's no mutual interest in your relationship for one another, where all the difficulty and the strife and the contention come from, very well may mean that you are harboring sin unrepented of over a long period of time. You think that it's okay because it's long past and it's still wreaking havoc in your marriage. You need to confess to your husband, confess to your wife, confess to the Lord, turn from sin and wage war together today. It may be old memories. 
It may be old fantasies. It may be your preoccupation right now with um, pornography. Uh, any number of ways that you can sin sexually against God and against your spouse. You've got to deal with that and repent today. Uh, Satan really only has two weapons that he can use against you. One, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian. One, we have to subtly shift just move your eyesight either to the left or the right away from that which God made for your good, intends for your good, and created for his glory. And just to get you to corrupt or to twist that which God intended for good. Um, the other is to assault or accuse the brethren, Romans 12. Just to simply assault or accuse you. Um, you sin in this way and you're right back in the bushes with Adam and Eve. Hiding from God, hiding from your spouse, sinning in secret. Um, you need to get out of the bushes. <laughs> Take the warfare out of the bushes, confess it openly, fight openly, work on it openly. Uh, you must come out of hiding on this and use the weapons that the Lord has given you. Amen? Um, this will wreak, ha wreak havoc in your marriage. Um, sexual immorality, sexual sin, if you're single, wreak havoc on your single life. Uh, this has to be dealt with. And if you're single, confess to a brother, get an accountability partner, get help. Um, submit yourself to the word of God in all of these things and wage war. Um, Got to wage war in our marriages. So again, don't be deceived by worldly or faulty reasonings of what marriage is to look like in this respect. You know, it's the old excuse. The older you get, the less important that becomes. It's worldly reasoning. Um, this is serious business and there, it will reap consequences if you're not obeying the Lord in this, okay? Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, God, I pray just in taking a look at this passage that we would recognize that you are infinitely wise and that you know what is best, uh, that your word is true, and that we just need to humble ourselves and obey you in these things. Um, Lord, we need to humble ourselves to our spouse uh, so that we can fight uh, these battles together. We need to humble ourselves to you and repent of sin, uh, turn to you in faith and trust you that you've given us the weapons that are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Uh, God, and to uh, confess to one another. And God, to have marriages in this sense, uh, following your commands here that are glorifying to you. Uh, so Lord, we acknowledge that your word is true and right, and that you are good and gracious, and that we, although undeserving, God, have your word, you, Lord, that we can trust in and depend on in having marriages that are healthy, that are God-glorifying in this. There's just so much temptation to sexual immorality, uh, so many ways that sexual immorality uh, devastates our day-to-day -day lives, devastates our, our marriages. It's not unlike it was in Corinth and uh, Paul's time. Lord, we recognize that we need even more today to, to fight and to fend off this gross black fungus that seeks to devour and to follow you in faith and just to obey you in these things for your glory, God, and for the, uh, the right testimony in a Christian marriage and for cultivating all those joys and uh, blissful realities of what it means to be married in Christ. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.